Hello. So previously we learned how to translate from English sentences into symbolic propositional logic. And part of the reason for doing that is that working in a formally defined language makes it a lot easier for us to analyze and prove things because we're working with very clear and well-defined idioms. So as you'll recall in translating into symbolic notation, we take all the atomic sentences and replace them with variables and then we're left with a bunch of variables that are connected by logical connectives. These are also known as logical operators or truth functions. But why truth functions? You might have learned about functions in math, but basically you can think of a function as kind of a factory that takes some values as input and spits out some value as output. A function will always return the same, val uh, same output when given the same input, and the output value should be fully determined by the input values. For instance, addition is a function which takes two integers as inputs and returns one integer, the sum, as the output. Without knowing exactly how this factory works or how the computation is performed, we can describe the addition function by describing its inputs and outputs. So that's what we've uh, done at least partially in this table here. So you can describe a function by producing a table that shows what outputs you get based on a given input. Okay, so what does this all have to do with logic? Well, consider a simple sentence containing a conjunction. For instance, it's raining and the game is over. In logic, we might represent this as P ampersand Q. So what you notice is that the ampersand, the AND symbol, combines P and Q. And in that sense, it's kind of like a function that takes P and Q, which stand in for sentences, as inputs. Okay, so what kind of output does this function produce? Well, syntactically, AND is used to create a complex sentence out of more simple sentences. But in logic, we're primarily interested in relationships between the truth and falsity of sentences. In particular, we really want to understand how the truth of P and Q relates to the truth of P and the truth of Q individually. Okay, so how does it relate? Well, let's think about some cases. Okay, let's take a look at sentence one. Squares have four sides and fish have four legs. Is sentence one true or false? That is, we're asking about whether it's true or false in reality now. Of course it's false because fish don't have legs, so the whole sentence is false, even though it's true that squares have four sides. So what that shows us is that when you have a conjunction and one of those sentences is true, but the other one is false, then the whole conjunction is going to be false. Okay, what about the second case? Squares have four sides and snow is white. Is that true or false? Well, it seems perfectly true as long as we ignore the fact that snow isn't always white because it might be dirty. Uh, each individual sentence, P and Q in this case, is individually true and so the conjunction of them together is also true. Okay, how about the third case? Fish have four legs and triangles are round. Is that true or false? Well, clearly false. All right, both parts of the sentence are false, so of course, in this case, two wrongs don't make a right, so to speak. So the sentence as a whole is false as well. So what that shows us is that when two sentences are combined with and, then the resulting sentence will be false if both of its parts are false. So we can learn from these examples exactly under what conditions using a conjunction or ampersand will result in a true sentence just in those cases where both of the sentences that are being combined with and are individually true. Essentially what we've just done is enumerated all the possible input and output conditions for the truth function and. The important thing to note uh, is that although syntactically and combines two individual sentences, as a truth function the input values are really just the truth values of the input sentences, not their content or what the subject matter happens to be. So as it turns out, the truth value of a complex sentence, say a conjunction, can be fully determined solely on the basis of the truth values of the input sentences. All right, so take a look at these definitions. Um, here we have some sentential variables, but we're just giving them a truth value. As you can see, we can calculate the truth value of the complex sentence solely on the basis of the truth values of the inputs. All right, so in sentence one, P is true and Q is false. So we have true and false, which is going to be false. 
In sentence two, we have Q, right, which is false, and S, which is false. So we have false and false, which is false. In sentence three, we have false and true together as inputs. So the conjunction, the output, is false. Finally, in sentence four, we have R, which is true, and P, which is true, and Q, which is false. So P and Q is going to be false, and therefore R and P and Q is going to be false. So the whole sentence is false. So what this shows us is the truth value of complex sentences depends only on the truth values of its sentential parts. It doesn't matter what the component sentences are about, it just matters whether they're true or false, and then we can use that information to determine whether the conjunction is true or false. All right, so that's why and and other such terms are called truth functions. They take in as input only the truth values of the component sentences, and they use that information to produce a truth value as output. Okay, so in the next video we'll explore truth tables, which provide a very clear way to encapsulate the rules about logical operators that we just discussed.